Councilwoman Quante Toons of uh, District 2 and Chair of the Budget and Finance Committee, along with Councilwoman Delicia Porterfield, who represents District 29, and she is Vice Chair of the Budget and Finance Committee. Tonight, we'll be talking with uh, Director Monique Odom of the Parks Department, as well as Director Shanna Whitelaw of Public Works. And the order will be that uh, Director Odom will present first, and then we'll open up the floor for Q&A for parks-related questions. And then we'll have uh, Director Whitelaw present for Public Works, and then we'll open up the floor for Q&A for Public Works-related questions. And if there's some time uh, left over, we'll open up the floor for questions for either of our uh, guest directors tonight. And we're going to go a little bit longer tonight. We usually try to stop around 17, 7.15, but we're going to go to 7.30 uh, tonight, but we'll have a hard stop at 7.30. And so at this time, I will turn the floor over to Director Odom. Thank you so much, Chair Toons and Vice Chair uh, Porterfield for this opportunity to be with you all um, and share um, a little bit about Metro Parks, one of our, uh, I'm gonna call it one of our dual departments in the city. Um, I am going to now move to, uh, let me see, share my screen, let me see. I can do that. And let's see, slideshow. Uh -oh. mm -hmm. There we go. There we are. Okay. So the mission um, of Metro Parks is to sustainably and equitably provide everyone in Nashville uh, with an invited, inviting network of parks and greenways that offer health, wellness, and quality of life through recreation, conservation, and community. In the Parks Department, we subscribe to the team cons concept. Our department has nine divisions that are just that, many teams inside of a larger team. Our team consists of the Community Recreation Programs and Cultural Arts Division, Community Affairs, Consolidated Maintenance, Finance and Administration, Greenways and open spaces, outdoor recreation and environmental education, parks police, planning, and revenue producing facilities. For the purposes of this particular presentation, I'll focus mostly on divisions that have a direct and immediate impact on our community. And I know that some of the questions that we have will be um, more toward um, the infrastructure of our department. So I look forward to that time. Our current um, FY 2021 revenue sources are um, pictured there. As you can see, golf, the Parthenon, and Sportsplex are the three largest revenue producers in our department. I like to call them the big three. And the top of the big three, golf, is weather dependent. So that revenue, though it may be the largest uh, revenue source, it can vary. Uh, but we have seen, well, before uh, COVID-19, we saw tremendous growth in our, our golf uh, revenue and golf operations. Oh, and then too, just as a, um, a note, all of our revenue collected through the department is returned to the general fund. Our operating budget for FY21 is approximately $43.3 million. And this slide shows, can give you a, a good depiction of you know, how, the, um, how the budget, operating budget is um, divided and then some of the expenses that we have. Um, so our budget is um, divided into three categories, like they are in Metro, that salaries, benefits, and then other expenses. And as you look at this, um, this slide, you'll notice that um, about 77% of our budget uh, are personnel expenses. That is um, typical for most organizations, um, not just in Metro, but most organizations, the largest expenditure um, are personnel expenses. And then we have about $9.8 million that are other expenses. Now, typically, uh, people describe uh, other expenses as discretionary. I like to call them 
um, necessaries for the most part. So we have about $9.8 million left after you take the, our, our personal expenses out. You have utilities, internal service fees, and then there's some, um, um, some um, fund transfers that, that happen in our budget. After you take all of those out, um, then there's about 3.5 or 3.6, let's say $3.6 million left in our budget for everything else for the rest of the fiscal year. Now, um, understanding that the parks industry is a seasonal industry for the most part. So um, that is to say that golf and other outside activities occur on a seasonal basis. And for, um, for illustrative purposes, um, I've divided this budget that's left of $3.6 million into 12 equal parts, but that is not in reality how that budget would be spent. It, in the summer months, it would be higher than in the winter months. Nevertheless, taken from if this $3.6 million, which is everything else that will be left in the budget, there are all sorts of other necessaries. And that's why I don't call them, uh, call this discretionary. So there's um, all kinds of operation, operating expenditures that we would incur to continue to operate the park. So there's um, our telephones, there are contracts, uh, temporary service contracts, say for uh, janitorial services, um, uh, janitorial supplies, uh, uniforms and safety shoes, chemicals for um, vegetation control and golf courses, recreation supplies, and other maintenance supplies. So that is about $2.4 million out of that $3.5. Um, and that is for a department that, that spans, the, a system that spans the entire county that's not very much. And let me roll back up for just one moment. I overlooked something that I think sometimes people, um, when particularly when they're looking at the budget book, Metro budget book, um, and they see that we have 1,290 positions, they believe that um, all of those positions are filled, all of them are full-time, um, and that is not true. Um, on a regular basis, we have about um, 600, a little over 600 regular full-time and part-time positions. The rest of them are either seasonal or what we call pool employees that are, you know, as needed sports officials, say for instance, they're on an as needed basis. So they're not even a full FTE for our department. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the benefits of parks. From an economic standpoint, we know that parks uh, improve the quality of life in communities and also contribute to the economic development of an area. A recent NIPA study notes that three quarters of corporate executives rate quality of life features as important factors when choosing a location for a headquarters, factory, or other company facilities. We know that parks spur tourism to their respective locale, locales, excuse me, generating significant economic activity. Economic research has demonstrated consistently that homes and properties located near parklands have higher values than those farther away. And we know that parks can reduce the costs associated with flood damage to property and keep water off sports fields and other amenities. We know that parks promote improved physical and mental health by providing opportunities for physical activity and a great setting to help recover from mental fatigue, both of which we have seen essential, seen, have been essential in 2020 and going forward in 2021 as we continue to endure this global pandemic. Then there's the social benefits. Green infrastructure can, prov can provide benefits to communities that help increase the bonds between community members, strengthen relationships, and promote healthy lifestyles by creating safer spaces and close-knit and engaged communities. The environmental benefits of parks are critical. They include healthier air, reduced flooding, cleaner water, and cooler air. The economic, health, social, 
and environmental impact of parks is undeniable. And that is why we say that parks are essential. Now here's something you as government officials should find interesting. A recent study by NRPA found that 95% of government officials are park users and 99% agree that their communities benefit from parks or park amenities in their area. I am not surprised by that at all. Nashville loves her parks, um, and that includes elected officials and everyone else. Local government officials also say that their parks department is a solution to some of the top issues facing their communities, like youth crime and promoting quality of life, but are less, less likely to view parks as a contribution to their number one concern, attracting and retaining business. And while six and seven elected officials agree that parks are well worth the tax dollars spent on them, they indicate that when cities face budgetary pressures, it's parks departments that are likely to suffer the largest cuts in funding. So let's get into some of the programs and services and other amenities that our department offers. Our community recreation division is extensive with 10 regional centers, 16 neighborhood centers, one senior center, one indoor tennis center, six indoor pools, three seasonal outdoor pools, the First Tee Golf Program, and an extensive cultural arts program, which includes music, dance, fine arts, and theater. Our community centers offer a diverse range of programming for people of all ages, we offer an after school and summer enrichment programs, as well as grab and go lunches for those who need them. This year, we've opened centers on Saturdays to answer community demand. And I'd like to give a special shout out uh, to Council Member Gamble for helping us move forward with that, those Saturday hours. Our cultural arts program encompasses popular summer concerts like the Big Band Dances and Dragon Music Sundays, art exhibits and classes, theatrical performances, as well as dance. Our dance team filmed last year's Mini Nutcracker, Mini Nutcracker performance with many of you, which many of you know is a Nashville tradition. Now, I know several of you in the um, public and audience and council members have called on our consolidated maintenance team many times to address anything from fallen trees to inoperable water fountains. Our consolidated maintenance team has four units, grounds, construction, landscaping, and custodial. Our grounds crew is responsible for maintaining and repairing athletic fields, picnic shelters, playgrounds, responsible for trash collection, restroom repairs, and mowing. Our grounds crews mow over 4,000 acres per month. The construction group is organized in the traditional, traditional trade areas of carpentry, masonry, electrical, plumbing, painting, and HVAC. This team is best described as a small construction and repair company that can address most of the issues that occur in our parks and buildings. The landscaping crew maintains all of the shrub and flower beds in parks, that's 13 acres, 600 downtown planters, 1,300 downtown trees, six fountains, 20 irrigation systems covering 60 acres, and four green roofs. Landscaping also manages a greenhouse that will grow 140,000 flowers annually. Also, as a part of this team is a tree crew, and this landscaping crew is the crew that is responsible for the city holiday tree. Our custodial team is responsible for cleaning and sanitizing all of the facilities in the park. This is performed through both full-time employees 
and outside contractors. This team usually works late at night when most facilities are closed to the public. Our greenways are one of our most popular amenities. Nashville's greenways are primarily based along our eight major water corridors, the Cumberland River, Stones River, Mill Creek, Seven Mile Creek, Rounds Creek, Whites Creek, Richland Creek, the Harpeth River, and in the urban core. Our, our, our outdoor recreation and environmental uh, team includes nature centers and Fort Nabley. Our nature centers are the spot for environmental education in this city and are popular with people of all ages. Our outdoor recreation team permits and has oversight of kayak and stand-up paddleboard outfitters that use Metro Parks locations for water access on the Cumberland River. During the summer, our outdoor recreation team primarily focuses on community-centered youth programming. Our planning team, working with outside contractors and community organizations, oversees the planting, design, and construction of parks and parks facilities. Projects range from community centers, dog parks, sports fields, playgrounds and, tra and trails, to historic restoration, habitat restoration, and site master planning. And these are a list of some of our most recent projects and one not listed on there but pictured was the opening of the Cassie Gardner Senior Park on Jefferson Street. Our parks police team help ensure that the city's parks and greenways remain safe for everyone. Parks police responded to more than 2,100 calls for service last year. They work very closely with our special events team who permit festivals, concerts, marathons, and other events in our parks. Our revenue producing team operates most of our revenue generating facilities and programs which include those listed there, golf courses, the Centennial Sportsplex, the Parthenon, Two Rivers Mansion, Wave Country, Hamilton Creek Marina, Cumberland Park Spray Grounds, the East and West Bank Docks at the Riverfront, and they also do the permitting of sports fields, picnic pavilions, they do outdoor fitness, and model airplane permits. That division also operates our very popular disabilities program. Our very popular disabilities program that is a supervised recreation program for individuals with intellectual and de developmental disabilities. And that program has been in uh, operation for more than 40 years. That is the end of my overview and presentation of the Parks Department. And I'm now ready to entertain your questions. Thank you so very much, uh, Director Odom. That was just a, a wonderful and informative uh, presentation. Um, you actually covered the, the first question um, that we received. I feel like you, you pretty much covered that. It was um, with regards to the number of parks, acreage, and community centers. Um, so mm -hmm. thank you for, uh, for covering that, and, and you did touch on those services. Um, so if we could just go ahead and talk about uh, some of the, the uh, budgetary items. Um, I know over the last few years, you all have had to have some uh, targeted savings in your department. Yes. Um, yes. So, and I think that's been like a, a misconception. People believe that there have not been budget cuts. Um, so if you could just speak about those targeted savings and what impact the budget constraints have had on your department. Um, as, and also, what are some things that you all have had to cut or pull back on on the last years uh, due to those budget constraints? Thank you so much, um, Councilman Porterfield, for, for that question. Um, we, our, our department does have, um, it's currently understaffed across the department. Um, so, if you will recall over the past um, two years, so FY18 and 19, we were uh, we had targeted savings of um, $1,065,000. So those, for us to meet those targeted savings, 
those were um, vacant positions that we held and were not able to hire. So we held them for two years. And of course, our expectation was at some point those positions would be released and we would be able to move forward with um, hiring those positions. But as you know, uh, this current year, FY20, um, targeted savings that had been held were um, eliminated from position from department budget. So we did lose those positions. We did lose that budget authority. Um, in addition, um, you know, COVID has been um, trying for Metro uh, among other organizations, but um, you know that we are in the midst of a hiring freeze. Um, I think one of your questions that you have on here, I'm going to kind of move across some of these questions because they are kind of, um, the, my responses will be intermingled. But um, we have about 100 vacant positions that are frozen. Now, the, to be clear, um, we have been given guidance that if it's a, a safety issue or safety-related positions, that we need to put those forth and, um, um, you know, Put those forth and try to and try to hire for those. So those are allowed to be unfolded. So positions like uh, if it's a park police officer or a lifeguard or anything safety related, um, we have been able to move forward with hiring of those. But we do have about 100 vacant positions um, with a team that's already understaffed. And so I think one of your questions that you ask: How many FTEs would parks need to consider itself fully staffed? We need about. Um, 51.88 uh, additional FTEs, and that's about 54 positions. So 54 positions and unfreezes 100 that we have, and we would be able to um, move forward in, in a positive way. Now, let me give a caveat to that, because for many years, um, many, many years, what we have had to do here in the Parks Department in order to um, meet our budget and stay within budget, our operating budget at the end of the year is um, maintain vacancies. So um, back to that slide on my presentation when I was talking about, um, you know, the other part of the budget. In that part of the budget, that's where all of the operations and uh, operations costs and resources are for folks to be able to do their jobs. And so we've got to make sure, we, so normally what we do is hold vacancies and over, we hold, hold vacancies and overspend in that area in the other part of the budget. So we balance, don't go over at the bottom line. Um, so if we were to, you know, wave a magic wand and we got these additional 54 positions and these 100 positions were unfrozen, we'd also need about $3 million in the other part of the budget so that we don't have to do that juggling, continue to juggle and hold vacancies in order to um, meet the budget, stay within budget. Um, let me see if, if there's something else. Oh, I also wanted to mention, just so that um, everyone is well informed, when we um, request positions, particularly in maintenance areas, particularly ground maintenance or well, anywhere in the consolidated maintenance area. Those requests for um, employees come with, uh, they, are, they have a corresponding um, fleet request because if we are hiring, just say we uh, need two new crews of folks, well, they need equipment and they need vehicles. And that is a fleet request that would accompany that request for um, staffing and operations in our operating budget. And so what has happened in the past, um, I wasn't director uh, at the time, but what has happened in the past is we got the positions, um, but we didn't get the equipment and the vehicle. So, I mean, you know, it was... Um, a lot of transfer, a shifting of um, shifting of positions that we that we had to do. So it didn't really meet the need that we needed to. And we have to be um, mindful to communicate that. Make sure we communicate that um, with both um, you all, the city leaders, and the finance department as we submit our um, our budget budget requests. Sorry, I was so long winded. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you, Director. I do just have one uh, follow up on that. Um, more specifically, uh, talking about like those targeted savings and some of the, the budget constraints. So, um, you know, you've kind of talked about how this had an impact on the fleet and on employees. Um, are there any services that you all have had to pull back or maybe, um, you know, services or vision that you all wanted to move forward with, but you all weren't able to um, due to uh, budgetary constraints? I mean, yes, we definitely have to, we have to both adjust, um, adjust hours, operating hours sometimes because staffs are laying. We are at um, skeleton, skeleton crews. So then um, if someone is out um, for whatever reason, if they're ill, you know, with COVID going around, there may be an exposure and someone needs to be out. We're kind of um, juggling. Um, so we have definitely had to um, adjust operating hours. And then, too, I just go back to the maintenance piece. We've, it's caused us to um, have extended maintenance cycles. So, um, you know, grass mowing ideally would be every seven days. We're now at 14 days, moving to 21. And sometimes, you know, we can move to 28. Um, nobody wants their neighbor to cut their grass, at, you know, in the growing season once a month. It just doesn't look good. Um, and, you know, we're all aware that we have a vast park system. And quite honestly, just the size of our park system and as many parks that we have, it's just an expensive operation. It just is. Um, but the best part that I always say, one of the best parts is that we have um, so many employees and staff members that are dedicated to what they do. They want, they want Metro to win. They want folks to enjoy the parks. They want the parks to be well taken care of and, and well manicured. And sometimes um, we just, you know, can't get to it the way that we would like to. I will openly admit that. But it is not uh, for lack of uh, want or trying. So I just want to make sure everybody knows that. Thank you, Director. I have to uh, second something that you said about um, the wonderful Parks employees. Uh, you all are, are fabulous, and I may be a bit biased, but uh, the Smith Springs <laughs> Center with Barbara Manuel and her crew, are, um, they're just phenomenal, and they do such a great job of, of taking care of our community, um, and they've just been such amazing community partners. So um, I believe uh, Chair Toombs has a question. Okay, thank you. So, Director Odom, we have talked about, you know, budget constraints and these constraints have been in place for the last uh, few years. And so we know that COVID-19 adds a, a entirely new layer on top of that. So can you talk about how COVID-19 has impacted your department? Have duties decreased? Have you decreased services? Can you explain that a little bit? So thank you so much for the question. Uh, so yes, we have been impacted um, significantly by COVID-19. So um, at one point early on, I think you all will remember early on in March um, when the city was adjusting um, to COVID, at one point our facilities were closed to the public. Um, and because we are um, walking kind of arm in arm with the health department and following CDC guidelines, we want to make sure that we are safe and operating in a safe way. So a lot of our programming um, has become virtual. I'm grateful that uh, we, we do have that option to offer, offer uh, virtual programming, but things like um, special events that would be coordinated in the park and revenue from that is down. Um, when um, our park system, parts of our park system were closed to the public, the facilities in particular, you know, outdoor amenities, some of them, most of them, the open spaces, golf courses, um, and areas like that remain open. And even though the golf courses were open, the clubhouses were closed. And so that certainly will impact revenue um, this fiscal year. Um, they were closed for some time. Um, Let's see, what else did I have? Uh, yeah, and then two, just in, um, as we move forward, and I think you know, we move forward to allow, to change some of the capacity limitations, and then we moved back. 
nevertheless, there have been capacity limitations. There have been um, some um, programs or events or meetings um, that we would normally have or permit out in uh, various facilities that we have not allowed just out of an abundance of caution for everyone's safety. So we have been, we've been um, impacted significantly. Yeah, I would say that. So have you repurposed employees or just had to send people home? Like how has that impacted the staff? So when folks, so we have about 300 folks that are considered essential employees. So that would be um, our consolidated maintenance, golf maintenance, uh, park police, and then my um, senior staff. So when, um, when the parks facilities were closed, emergency, we had an emergency closure, we worked with uh, human resources to make sure folks were still in a, a paid status um, so that they wouldn't be, you know, that creates all kinds of other problems. If someone is not in a paid status, they lose their benefits and, you know, it's a, a kind of a snowballing type of situation. So we are very grateful that um, human resources worked with us and I think a few other departments to make sure folks were in a paid status. So then folks that could work remotely, they did. That is when we came up creatively with um, some of our virtual programming we, um, you know, folks, you know, a lot of people did not, particularly those who have um, roles in the parks department that don't lend themselves to remote working. So I can work remotely, you know, because I'm in the office for the most of the time and, and all of that, and my resources are here. But if you are in a community center or a nature center, um, it doesn't lend very, very well to um, working remotely. But then, like I said, that is where some of our uh, most creative ideas came um, from with the uh, virtual programming. And then, too, we were a part, and are still are a part of the uh, food security group, uh, food security working group. And a lot of our community centers were locations for um, food pickup for um, Second Harvest Food Bank. So when the community center technically was not open, um, our staff came in and were working on that. Um, when the centers were, or other locations were closed um, to the public, that a lot of the time we were sanitizing and modifying workspaces and um, uh, you know retraining learning, uh, you know, the new COVID protocol and what we need to do, how to do it. So the time was used very wisely. Um, and we had uh, most folks chomping at the bit to get back into into uh, their facilities. And we've been open for quite some time now, working from our workspaces for quite some time now. And one last question before I kick it over to uh, Council on the Portfield. You mentioned, uh, and I, I'm not sure if it was in your, your sheet that showed the expenses and mm -hmm. revenue. How much revenue does parks typically generate, and then how has COVID impacted that revenue? We typically generate in a regular year when things are air quotes normal, it's about $14 million. And as I mentioned, all of that is returned to the general fund. Um, at my last um, analysis, we were about 36% um, under where we were this time last year before COVID. So um, it's been significant. Um, again, you know, I talked about golf being our largest revenue uh, source and uh, people have been grateful to that we have kept the golf courses open. But then too, as I also mentioned, the golf courses, the revenue at the golf courses did take a hit. It will have taken a hit for this year because the clubhouses um, we're not open for several weeks, but yeah, so we're about 36%. Under. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Director. I do have a, another uh, question here for you. And um, Councilmember Allen also uh, sent, sent in a question, so we'll, we'll try to um, acknowledge that one as well. Um, 
I know you all have been providing resources to help support families uh, during this time, such as uh, you said, you know, picking up food, um, being a place where families can go to pick up food and with Second Harvest. Um, are there are there any additional supports that you all have been providing um, during this time of COVID? Yes, and I'm glad you asked me that question. Um, our um, team in the Community Recreation Program um, has been supporting uh, essential workers of MMPS. So when uh, MMPS is in session and uh, those essential employees need to report to work, those, uh, if they have school age children, they can sign up and bring their children to, of course, their capacity limitations, but sign up and bring the children to the community center where they will be supervised, fed, uh, you know, help with their, of course, because the kids are in virtual school, um, assisted with staying on track. They get some physical activity um, during the day. So, yes, we've, um, and that, I'll just have to say, that brainchild, that was the brainchild of Stevon Nellums, who leads our community recreation division, um, that, you know, they you know, felt compelled to, to do something and support MMPS, and I'm very grateful. So, we do that, that is um, ongoing. We do have virtual after-school programs um, as well. So yeah, that's one of them. Uh, thank you, and then I have uh, one more question before we go back to Council Member Toombs. Um, and this is, uh, this kind of uh, resides over in our area by the, the lake. Um, mm -hmm. What's the partnership like between parks, the Army Corps engineers and TWRA? And for properties um, where those agencies may overlap, how do you all determine who pays for which um, expenses? So it really kind of um, depends. So I'll go back. So the, it's a collaborative uh, relationship. So um, some of it, depending on the, the location um, around the city, it, there may be a lease agreement with us and the Corps of Engineers, like at the, um, I think at the riverfront. Um, there may be a lease agreement with TWRA. I know that we have um, a, a long-term contract for them to um, support us and help us manage wildlife and kind of give us guidance when there are wildlife issues. But it just depends on what what the circumstance is. It is, um, you know, like I said, it's a collaborative um, collaborative relationships among us all. So. Normally, we can get together and um, whatever is best for the community, um, work toward that. Thank you so much, Director. I think uh, Council Member Toombs may have the last question for you. Okay. So, um, Director Odom, how how do you make the determination of where to put, you know, you, you mentioned new parks, like how do you make the determination of where to put these parks and community centers across town? Um, how do you determine like what becomes a regional center and how does funding impact those decisions? So um, new facilities or park lands are really um, about feasibility. Um, and it's really a marriage of um, political will, funding, um, community demand, um, uh, what am I forgetting? Um, and and when I say political will, um, and available funding. Um, and we should consider that recurring funding. So as you may know, um, we have a Parks and Greenways Master Plan that can offer some guidance. Um, it is, um, it's, uh, a menu of recommendations, but then really it, uh, it it informs us. It has a lots of information in it, but it's only, you know, a guiding piece. It's a living document. And the city, as the city changes, we have to take um, certain uh, factors into consideration. So, for instance, I'll just um, say if someone came to you and your district, and wanted a new community center there, um, aside from Hartman Community Center. Well, Hartman is considered a regional, and there are um, there's been lots of research that we have in this uh, master plan um, that determines what the service level is, or how many how many 
residents are in a service area for a regional center, a neighborhood center. Um, also in that master plan, it's moving toward, um, oh, I can't remember what they're called, but they're mega centers, mega centers where they would have two gyms. Well, that master plan was created in 2017 and we're in 21 now. You know, things change, the population change, changes, the demands of um, what constituencies want to see. Funding um, can be uncertain. That's, that's a huge factor. Um, so, again, it, it comes down to a marriage of all of those things, political will, community demand, um, feasibility. Um, but, but I think what we try to do is make sure that we are um, moving in the direction of the best public benefit, particularly if it's a you know um, a high dollar a high dollar amenity. You don't want to develop a high dollar amenity that only serves a small group of people. Um, we want to be you know good stewards of of, uh, of the resources and make sure that. Um, you know, with that, with whatever we are developing, we have a long-term plan. We can sustain it. That um, city leaders are informed about, um, you know, budgetary impacts of of uh, developing these new amenities. Thank you, Director. We have just a few more minutes before we go on over to uh, Public Works. I know Councilmember Allen uh, had a question. Uh, Councilmember Allen, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, you've, you've answered it partially, but I think just to say it explicitly, we, we have a goal of acquiring um, large parks in every quadrant, so there has been new land that, that parks has um, it's taken on. And can you just speak a little bit to everyone thinks it's great when we get more land for parks. Yeah. What does that do to you? Thank you so much for touching on that. And I will just say, um, ideally, um, it is great when we um, acquire land and open space to conserve it for the city. Um, but as I mentioned, let's roll backward to um, something that I talked about earlier, is staffing and resources. So when we acquire anything, a piece of land, then it becomes the, the um, responsibility of the department to maintain it. And if we're already, our staff is already thinly stretched, we um, are challenged in, with the resource, resources that we already have, that just adds something else onto the pile. And so, um, you know, uh, acquisitions come with operating budget in impacts. And we need to be mindful of that when, you know, everybody thinks it's, one of you said it, everybody thinks it's great when parks gets new land or I get, I get a lot of calls about, hey, we can just give this to parks. And uh, I have two minds about it. In one mind, I'm thinking, oh, that's great. We can conserve, um, you know, this, this land and this will be wonderful. But then the public administrator side of me is like, oh, no, no, we don't want to take it home because we can't, we can't maintain it the way that it probably needs to. Now, acquiring land um, that is landlocked and to be left a natural area and does not require any maintenance, that is ideal at this point. Yeah, that's ideal at this point. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you, Director. And it does not look like we have any other hands in queue. Uh, oh, we do have one more uh, uh, question, and this will be our last uh, question. So, uh, Councilmember Gamble, you're recognized. And after uh, Councilmember Gamble's question, um, if Public Works uh, can go ahead and start their presentation. Thank you so much, Vice Chair, and thank you, Director Oldham, for all the work that you and your staff are doing. Thank you for all of the work that you did in helping the after-school committee 
uh, advocate to open those centers on Saturdays. My question is, in, in light of the COVID, I mean, we were able to open them right as we were shutting down as a city because of COVID. I just wondered how that has impacted if, you, if you've been able to open on Saturdays at those community centers and how has that impact has been? And, and of course, I look forward to when we can are fully operational and can really take advantage of that great benefit for the community. Thank you so much, um, uh, Councilmember Gamble. Uh, shout out to you again for leading, the, helping lead the charge on getting those uh, Saturday hours for us, getting the funding for that. We have been able to move forward with opening on Saturdays at some community centers, right as we were moving for. So, you all are you know Metro by now that there is a process involved with everything. So when. Um, and, and most bureaucracies anyway. But the positions were approved, they had to go through budgets, they had to, you know, so then we had the hiring process and all of that. And right as we were moving through um, some of hiring for some of those positions, we hit a hiring freeze. And we were allowed to move forward with um, positions that had already been offered, we had made offers on. Um, that was not all of them, but we have been able to do um, some Saturday hours, which is great. And I'm looking forward to, um, and so is the staff, um, looking forward to moving toward, um, you know, when we're back fully operational and how the community can better take advantage of those hours. So thank you. Thank you. And if IT can make uh, someone from Public Works the host, we'll go ahead and get started on that Public Works presentation. Director Whitelaw is giving the presentation. Yes, yes, I was getting ready to say thank you for that. Ready to share. All right. Let me get my PowerPoint up. Can you see my PowerPoint? All right, can you see that? Not yet, no. Not yet, hold on, let me share my, I wish I was smarter than I look. All right, I'm getting there, I think. How about now? Yes, we can see it. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for um, inviting me um, to, to speak today. It's been kind of a fun presentation for me to put together because um, being pretty new to public works, I um, I feel like as I was learning um, in the last several months, I, it put me right in line with being able to to give a what does public works do? Um, I'm Shannon Whitelaw, I'm the interim director. I have with me here today, Sharon Wallstrom to um, help me along the way since I am so fresh to things and have not gone through a full budget series as public works. I'm gonna learn a few things along the way, but we'll kind of get started with what we have today. Our mission um, at public works is to deliver a wide range of services that help to define the quality of life for Nashville and Davidson County's residents, businesses, visitors, by ensuring a safe and convenient complete streets, transportation infrastructure, protecting the environment and creating cleaner, beautiful, and more livable neighborhoods. So really, in essence, that goes to really say that we're here um, in the background to make life a lot better for the citizens and the visitors and the community um, that we all live in here in Nashville. We're really broken up into three key divisions within public works, administrative, solid waste, right of way, and transportation. Um, we'll go into a little bit of that, but administrative is pretty much what you think. I think interesting, we have Hub Nashville 311. Solid waste um, has recycling, trash, and brush. And then right of way, which is everything that's in the right of way is really the public streetscape and transportation includes traffic parking, street maintenance, capital projects, bikeway, sidewalk design. So um, we'll get a little deeper into each one of these. So overall, what we do in, in public works is we are maintaining um, what I say quality of life and necessary um, things to make our, our city livable 
and our community um, functioning. We have this recycle drop-off centers, the convenience centers. We um, collect a million pounds of refuge or trash from homes all in USD. Um, several folks might have remembered this summer when we had a little struggle with that and that we just recently went from four-day collection to five-day collection. We also, on the, on the other side of the house, is over 2,000 miles of public roadways and right-of-ways, more than 835 signalized intersections, so we call that um, traffic lights, 6,000 public streets, 300 bridges, 140 miles of bikeways, and 2,000 parking meters, and 18,000 parking spaces. So when you think of it, there's a whole lot of um, infrastructure that is spread across the county and the, and the municipality that really goes to day to day. And, and that's a lot of little things and a lot of big things. We currently have 418 employees that um, support this effort every single day. So diving in a little bit, I think most people um, know what when we say waste recycling and yard waste is, but um, weekly trash collection is for our customers in USD. And we have about 140,000 of those customers to date. So um, that has increased. Uh, we provide monthly recycling collection to about 100,000 customers. That is a voluntary program. If you um, want uh, recycling, you can ask for a cart and we will provide you a cart. So we encourage people to do that. And brush collection is quarterly, um, which is a service we provide through everyone in the USD and the GSD. For those who live in the GSD and the USD across um, the city, we have convenience, community convenience and recycling centers. And we have two primary ones on the east side. And they, um, the one off of, um, of uh, Trinity is the one that takes your hazardous household waste. So we're talking batteries and old computers, paints, um, hazardous materials. Um, and tires are also there. So we take pretty much anything, um, white goods that um, you, you can't get rid of in your, in your car, I guess is the best way to say it. So that's a place to go if you need to get rid of those things. Um, as I said earlier, we just recently moved to a five-day um, uh, five collection cycle and changed our recycling um, days to five days as well. I'm hopeful that most folks here was able to get their magnet because we want to encourage um, recycling. And so we sent out um, magnets to our customers in the USD, reminding them of when their recycle day is so that we can um, encourage recycling. Our goal is to minimize waste and encourage recycling and encourage um, reuse as much as we can. We have a lot of um, educational programs and webinars I'd like folks to know about that they could go to the website on that really go to the heart of what people can do. One of my favorites that we just did recently was how to compost and how you can um, minimize your footprint that much more through composting. And then also uh, C&D, which is construction and demolition uh, recycling, how it, as all the new growth is occurring in Nashville, we want to encourage C&D recycling, as we call it. Um, so that's not ending up in our landfills as well. So we want to make sure that we are giving our customers every opportunity to minimize their footprint with a, a, with a long-term goal of zero to a landfill. Now, we know that's a, a dream, but that is something that I think is doable and we are working toward. And I'm excited to continue expanding that um, through the next years. Another element that a lot of folks don't know that comes under uh, public works is community beautification. M many folks don't know that there is a Metro Beautification and Environment Commission. It has um, a commissioner that is from all of our council districts. So for all 35 council districts, there is a, a beautification commissioner. And I know that several actual council members at one time were beautification commissioners. So we appreciate the continual service. So this is a commission that really wants to improve the, the right of way and the look of our city. So there are programs that are that are we work with that commission on, such as the Adopt a Street program, litter prevention, and one that is, I think, 
a really popular one right now are, are trees. And trees in the public right of way fall under public works, but we also work in partnership with Metro Stormwater, with codes, with many of the nonprofits across the city to really try to increase the number of trees that are in our city because we know how much trees are a benefit to both just emotional and mental health as well as to our environment. They are a great capture of stormwater. They're a great way to get oxygen back into our city and our system. And um, please look into trying to get into an adopt a tree program. We have um, access to that on our website as well. And in fact, um, we're working with several nonprofits tomorrow to be planting some trees and on Monday planting some trees. So one thing that we do that a lot of people don't realize come out of public works. One of the biggest things that I think most people see that come from public works is the right of way. And when we talk about right of way, these are the things we're talking about, roadways, traffic signal signs, marking, sidewalks, bikeway, everything that is not what I like to call private prop property or a park or a public area, if it's um, a way in which we're doing active transportation and moving from one place to the other, it probably falls in the right of way. Associated with that are two commissions that we have um, that are our um, public works works with those commissions. It's Traffic and Parking Commission and the Transportation Licensing Commission. I will say I myself as a long-term citizen of Nashville, Tennessee did not know about the Tra Transportation Licensing Commission myself until I came to Public Works. That is the commission that actually licensed taxi cabs and um, other modes of transportation, the horse carriages that you might see downtown. All of those um, entities have to have a license and have to show proof of insurance, so proof of, of their ability to to um, work in our city and and be safe for our environment, our, our customers. Traffic and Parking Commission is one I think a lot of people might know about the results of, but might not know that there is a commission that um, actually works with where parking, loading zones, valet zones, parking meters, what the speed limit is on a um, street and, um, all that goes with that. So we work with them to, to support both of those commissions, as well as parking enforcement, and which also ties to that in the in the USD area. One thing that I think is interesting that a lot of people don't realize um, for right of way is permits. So I want to dig a little deeper into that, that most people kind of think they know, but they don't really know that a permit is really required for any type of activity that occurs in the right of way or touches the right of way. So when we see all the new construction that's going on across the city um, with excavations or, or cuts and street closures for construction, those kinds of activities, a permit is required. And we, uh, everybody has to come through public works to get a permit um, for the types of activities that you see here. Um, folks don't realize that encroachments into the right-of-way, things like signs and canopies and aw uh, awnings, or even when fiber optic, we've seen a lot of fiber optic that's come through uh, and continues to come through, they do get a permit to be in the right-of-way and to do their work in the right-of-way. So um, I think that's an area that most folks are not really realizing that there is a permit and we have inspectors who are going out regularly to make sure that those activities are occurring within the limits of the permit and are occurring to meet our specifications and what um, is deemed appropriate. So uh, the other thing I think that most folks might not realize about um, public works is that the Hub Nashville 311 Center is, um, part of public works. It's a partnership with the mayor's office. It is really managed from the mayor's office in many ways, but the, the nine full-time employees associated with Home Nashville are actually public works employees. Um, they respond typically to more than 15,000 requests a month by um, phone, app, or email. And this is one of the greatest things I, as a citizen, also have appreciated about Nashville, that you can call 311 and basically ask any question about what's going on in the city as far as missed trash, 
recycling, um, special event, pothole problem, and they will work through that to um, get it to the right department and make sure. So you could call with a stormwater question or a water question and it will route to water services. Most of the questions are related to public works. Almost um, probably 70% oh, or more can be related to mist trash or mist recycling um, activities. So um, we do that. One of the things I was listening to Director Odom's question about uh, COVID and how employees were working from home or able, all of our hub employees have been working from home since the beginning of, of the pandemic and we haven't missed a beat. So I think that's one of those areas when people say what, what's happened since then. Well, these folks, if you've called 311 and someone's answered a phone and, and it's been processed, that person has a quote home office at this point and has been continuing to, to work non without missing a beat since that time frame. Some of the things that we've accomplished just in this last year is the responded to the historic uh, March 3rd tornado, obviously the, the events that occurred on Christmas Day on 2nd Avenue. Um, a lot of folks don't realize that it's Public Works employees who are out there helping to clean up the debris, who are, if there's fencing or security as far as supporting the police and other departments, um, Public Works employees are there. Public Works employees are providing um, equipment and people to um, just help with cleanup, brush removal, all the limbs and trees from uh, the tornado, all of the debris from the Christmas Day activities. That was Public Works employees who were supporting all the other departments who were also down there um, on those events. So we also, as you can see, I, I talked about how many right-of-way permits and how important permits are. 32, almost 33,000 permits were issued um, in 20. 20. We paved 133 um, miles of, of lane miles of, of Nashville roads, repaired over 44,000 potholes, and um, collected. I was surprised by how much litter there is. Over 567 tons of litter was um, collected by Public Works folks in the last um, year. And as I mentioned earlier, we are um, always wanting to educate on recycling and composting. And so we have provided those workshops and the majority of those workshops were webinars and were um, virtual. And we're really pleased with the number of participants that we got with those workshops um, despite the pandemic. So we continue to, to move on with that. Um, since I know this is really about where our money goes, I, the question becomes, well, how much does all of this cost? What is the money um, related to this and how much um, do we have? Our budget last year was um, just over 119,000, the one we're in um, last year. And then um, with, and you see the breakdown there, kind of the three big buckets I was talking about, that trash and recycling is about 26 million, the call centers just under a million and transportation and right away activities are about 92 million. So you can see that about 75 to 77 percent of our budget is really tied to transportation and right of way. And I think, folks, um, hopefully, um, most of our constituents and most of the city is aware of the transportation plan that was recently passed by council and the idea of how do we take um, that transportation plan and put it into action. And so when about 77 percent of your budget is tied to transportation, um, it then lends itself to, okay, where do we move from there? So well, most of this operating budget is tied to the activities I just talked about. So this is related to um, filling potholes and um, cleaning streets and picking up um, rush and signals and signs. Those are all operating activities, but we also have um, capital money. So a large portion of our budget is tied to capital um, spending. And as you can see here, we had a very small capital spending budget uh, for the FY19 to 20 
budget. So with only $6 million paving in the previous few years, past years, the paving number has been around $30 million in capital. So that has been reduced and that goes to some of the questions about um, reduced spendings or having um, uh, what I would call um, not reduced spending, but yes, it is reduced spending. Um, but not having the sidewalks only 4 million in the past, that number has been 20 million for capital sidewalk um, program. Traffic calming, which is for those who are not aware, traffic calming is when we do review. Um, neighborhoods can put in applications to have traffic calming measures placed in their neighborhood. Um, and it is an application process in which we um, review it based on several criteria. So mainly, number one is safety. And um, we've had a real success with that, but you can get about 20 to 25 projects a year with, with 1.5 million. Capital projects, those are mainly projects that are tied to TDOT. They can be things that where we can do some improvements with TDOT in the state on state right of ways related to sidewalks or related to other infrastructure improvements. And then, as you can see, the others with bikeways and bridges and culverts and traffic signals. Um, bridges and culverts is one that recently, as you look at this number and you say, it looks a little skewed. Why did bridges and culverts have so much money compared to the others from a capital standpoint? Um, many of you may have remembered that uh, Mayor Cooper redirected funds from the Gulch Bridge project. That was one of the first things that he did as part of his administration. And a large portion of that went to bridges and culverts to be spread across the county, um, across all the council districts, um, so that um, everyone could use that money. And in solid waste, when people say, what's the capital related to solid waste? Well, that can tie into um, recycle carts and as well as other carts and as well as equipment. And one of the things you don't see in our capital spending, which is very similar to what um, Director Odom was talking about is you don't see vehicles. We we work in concert with the Office of Fleet Management to provide us with uh, all of the heavy equipment and all of the um, vehicles that we use on a daily basis. So it's not part of our capital spending, but it is very important that we work with OFM to make sure that um, our fleet is running and up and, and, and going and we're getting the appropriate equipment and they do a really good job with, with the limited funds that they've, they've received in the last few years. One of the things I, I want to end with here is, is just sharing with you the um, website. So, so much of what we do, I think is it's easy to, to overlook the idea that going to a website can give you a lot of information. So, um, it, at our website, it can show you exactly how to sign up for um, service. You can find where, what trash day, what recycle day, what your brush schedule is, and it provides a lot of other information relative to what we do at Public Works. So, with that, um, kind of gives you a brief overview of what we do, and um, I'm welcome questions. Thank you, Director. I will uh, go ahead and get us started. That was a, a very comprehensive um, uh, presentation. So thank you so much uh, for the information. And uh, you guys do have a really good uh, website. I direct my constituents there uh, pretty much on a daily basis. <laughs> um, and I, I visit it pretty much on a daily daily basis, getting information. So thank you so much. Um, so can you speak a little bit about um, if you all have a, a staffing sh shortage uh, in your department, uh, how many FTEs would you need to um, be considered fully staffed? And how do you determine uh, what is fully staffed? And then if you could also tie into that, um, if you could compare the size of our public works department to uh, the size of the public works departments of some of our peer cities. Sure, thank you for that question. I think, um, I think being, First, I want to start with the last question, if that makes sense. How do we compare with peer cities? And I think that's a challenging question in the sense that every city's public works department involves something different, if that makes sense. Um, some public works will include stormwater. Some public works don't have solid waste included in them. Some 
Some cities don't include a lot of their transportation and public work. So it can be a challenge, but we do know that one that is very similar to us is Indianapolis. So Indianapolis is a city that's kind of the same size and on the same thing. They do a lot of the same activities, the same sort of scopes that we have with solid waste and transportation. And they have 724 um, employees. It does include a fleet, so there is some there, where we have around 415. That is our current space right now, 415 employees. So you can see that we have a difference in employees. But as far as how short staff we are, during the um, targeted savings program, we did eliminate 12 positions. Um, so that's 12 we knew. And then gradually, over the last several years, as we all have, I think all departments have have struggled with um, savings and being required and requested and asked to do savings. We've all challenged with that. So we do have a staffing shortage, but I think it can be sort of challenging to say exactly what that number is as we're trying to move through with a baseline. We know the 12 that, that we eliminated and we have some other areas, particularly as we're looking toward the transportation plan, areas that maybe we know we're understaffed, but need to be um, increased. So um, the shortage is there. What we've done is we have supplemented a lot of that with consultants and, and getting consultant support. And one of the things we'd like to do is shift those consultant dollars back to FTE. So learning that balance and figuring that balance out is one of the things we've got to work for. Thank you. And one follow up to that question. Um, how do the staffing shortages impact the work that Public Works does? And um, how are those services uh, impacted uh, from the standpoint of the services that our constituents are receiving? So, so you know, what, sure. what's their experience like with the with the uh, with you all being understaffed? Sure. Um, I think one of the, the things that you, that really can handle that that can happen to when you're when you're short staffed is one example would be we don't get to cut in the right of way. Kind of go back to to parks, you know, conversation is how often can you mow? Well, Public Works is responsible for for mowing in the right of way, and obviously, just just the same in the summer, you'd like to mow more often than you can. But when you're short staff, that's one area that that would fall back. Another area is we have brush quarterly. Once upon a time, people might have remembered that brush was picked up six times. Um, a year and, and could be picked up six times a year and now it's quarterly. So it, it impacts those services in that way. Um, convenience centers, um, we, they're open, but they could be open longer hours and could be open, you know, maybe different times if we had more staffing. So it's some of those fundamentals that doesn't mean you're not getting a full service, but you're not getting the, as much opportunity as you could. Thank you, Director. And then I'll uh, have one more question and then I'll turn it over to Councilmember Toombs. Um, so you touched on uh, the mayor's transportation plan. Um, could you talk some about the proposed new Department of Transportation and also share with us what transportation duties um, you all are currently responsible for? I know you did. You touched on it in the, the presentation and if you could just, you know, uh, clarify that. Sure, sure. Um, so one of the things when, um, when I came, when I was asked in the mayor's presentation of, of, of me becoming the interim director, one of, one of my um, goals was to evaluate um, what are options for a uh, Department of Transportation. That is one of the initiatives that the mayor had. And it's also something that is highlighted in the transportation plan. Um, so I have been looking at where, what, what a Department of Transportation could look like and and, and the need for it. And I do believe that uh, along with um, Ms. DeBosimo, that there are real energy synergies that could be um, accomplished by having a dedicated Department of Transportation. As you heard from my presentation just now, there's really two big chunks of solid waste and transportation activity that are, are housed in one group called Public Works. So sometimes you lose the ability to um, have a focused effort on what, what um, can be done or what should be done. I always like to think of it, it's kind of like you have two kids and they're both fighting for the same pot of money in many ways and not able to um, to, to fight their, their case and, and articulate their needs as well. 
So currently right now, I'm, I'm in an evaluation standpoint. I do believe that there is a, um, a, a, a um, advantage in a Department of Transportation that could be, could be done. Currently, Public Works pretty much has most transportation activities except for WECO. WECO clearly has a large transportation element relative to, to all that they do. And also there's some planning activities that are up front that are housed in the planning department that are related to transportation. So when, you know, big scale planning activities of where our future roads would go, how would things look, how do you do it, um, interactive and con connectivity, as we would say, between neighborhoods, active um, transportation relative to bikeways and greenways and, and um, different types of streets and streetscapes, all of that's in planning that that's also not part of what public works does. But the, the state of good repair, as I like to call it, as far as maintaining the actual roads and the right of way, that is in public works. So I have several uh, questions, but before I, I get to those, I want to acknowledge uh, Councilwoman Henderson. You have a question? Thank you so much, Chair Toombs, and uh, thank you, Director Whitewell. Can, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I can. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, I, I appreciate you uh, speaking to the kind of issue of, of staffing and um, consultancy. And um, I noticed that, you know, your operational budget is up about $18 million over the last three years. And so you know, I'm, I'm wondering kind of to what do you attribute that? Um, obviously, capital spending is down um, it, as you look at that over the last kind of three budget cycles. Um, if you could speak um to that, and then um, on the the kind of swing from your DOT question, or rather comments, um, I think when we were doing some things around the transportation plan, um, Ms. DeMassimo or you, or perhaps um, you all both shared, uh, they thought that a kind of a draft proposal of sorts or org chart, a potential organization for this DOT might be uh, forthcoming in, in early 2021. And so I'm wondering kind of by what date, what's your horizon on that? And um, kind of how will that uh, affect this budget season, if at all? Because I think a lot of us are kind of looking at, you know, the, the depth of the queue on traffic calming, um, that we only have one staff member doing traffic calming. Um, so if, you know, we want to deliver things uh, you know, robustly that have a really high return on investment like bikeways and traffic calming um, that, you know, we, we need to do some things for staffing there. But I feel like we, we hesitate on the staffing end because we have the DOT sort of looming. And so I, I feel that we've been somewhat betwixt in between. And I absolutely appreciate that you're in a kind of a, an evaluative space right now in a transition. So I hope you can just maybe speak to that um, kind of from a staffing and programmatic perspective. And then also the, the question about the um, operational uh, budget increase. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Council Member Henderson. I think um, those are all very thoughtful uh, questions, and I appreciate it. From the OAM budget increase, um, a lot of that is related to the solid waste and increases in um, fees and collections. As I was saying, that sort of one one pot of money and you don't really know where that pot of money increase necessarily is so um, a lot of that was tied to that also um, recycling activities so um, it just overall increases in shortages and trying to um, to staff up one of the one of it was additional um, employees that uh, went to brush collection to be able to and mowing we, we took over some right-of-way mowing and in increasing that staff. So it's still low, but um, it's there. And additionally, there was um, a USD expansion, not the most recent one, but one a, 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 few, a couple of years ago. So you've increased um, expansion in that, which goes back to what I was saying, like solid waste and that sort of thing. So that's the OAM. Our capital budget, um, our, and it wasn't the budget, it's the capital spending plan, is, is significantly de decreased 
um, in this last cycle, as I think most people would do to, um, I think, the well-documented um, needs of the city and the financial crisis that the city was in. And so um, it was a matter of that. We are hopeful um, that in the in the next capital spending plan, we will be there, uh, be back up to normal. And in fact, that ties in nicely to the, the conversation related to the transportation plan and the Department of Transportation. Um, the transportation plan, as I know you're really aware of, um, really outlined some money and some big ticket numbers relative to what really needs to be done. And many of that, as I, I've noted, state of good repair is getting back to um, what needs to be a baseline funding for capitalize of, of paving and sidewalk repairs and bridges and culverts and getting those back to where they need to be so that we have at least a baseline of maintaining all of the assets that we have, as well as, as, as the transportation talks about, expanding the capacity of what we have um, in the city as far as new sidewalks and new bikeways and traffic calming them. In the transportation plan, there's $7 million um, identified for active transportation, which would tie to bikeways. Um, I think there's $7 million just related to bikeways, and there's another $7 million related to traffic calming and active things, because there, you, your point is well taken, 181 applications. Um, for traffic calming, when we have um, 1.5 million is certainly not going to um, cover that. And as part of that, we are evaluating the need for additional staff. One of the things that I think is important is you can't have one person doing that much. So what would be a, a um, programmatic staffing up of, you know, maybe over a, a year or two of key hires in key areas so that we can um, utilize those funds as they come in. And also the goal is to um, is to move away from a dependence that we have had on consultants that was tied in the capital program and, and bring that knowledge and expertise in-house as we can continue forward. So that is part of the evaluation. Um, as far as timing, um, we have been working with it, but unfortunately one of the things that has slowed things down, we were in a good mood, and then unfortunately the event of, of Christmas Day has kind of put a, a little bit of a wrinkle and a, a refocus for, for a period of time. So um, that slowed things down, but we are continuing to move and hope to have something you know, by the end of this month um, that would be there. And it is, it is the thought of what would a Department of Transportation look like? What would that organization look like? What would the needs be for that organization to be able to meet um, all of the um, the action items that are in the transportation plan. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hey, Director Whitewall, is there a, um, I guess, a, a timeline as to when, if we went towards having a, a separate Department of Transportation, is there a goal as to when that department would actually come into existence? Um, I'm not really sure that that's something I can really answer, if that makes sense. That becomes more of an administration. I can make recommendations, but I, mm -hmm. I would hate to speak for an administration because I don't know where they're going, so. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to um, touch a little bit, a bit on the uh, the revenue that Public Works generates. We talked about the expenses and, and how much it costs to, to run the department, but uh, I know there are there's parking meters, and I know there was a discussion pre-COVID about parking meter enforcement and, and money that Metro was missing from, you know, lack of enforcement of, of parking meters. Also, you talked about the permits, so I know there's revenue generated from that. So can you talk about the revenue that the department generates? I am... We can, I can talk about the revenue. I'll be honest, I'm not very good, and I, I would have to defer to Sharon to give you an exact number. Sharon lost her okay. numbers of revenue. She's much more connected. But generally speaking, you are correct. Um, we, our revenue comes from various things, convenience centers. There are fees at the convenience centers for trips and tires and, and things like that. We, we do receive fees there, parking. Um, not only is it... Um, 
parking fines and fining people who are who are illegally parking, but also uh, the money generated from putting your little quarter inch of the parking meter. Um, so um, I believe that's somewhere around a million dollars a year, but Sharon can correct me. And then there's also um, fees relative to permit. So Sharon, can you give just a little heads up on how much of our, uh, how much revenue we do create? Okay, our um, total revenue projection for last year, I was looking at the more detailed numbers, um, was around 30, total revenues was around 56 million, and that did include the transfer numbers. Um, we do get revenue for, for uh, special permits that we handle. We also get revenue, as you said, for the parking meters. Um, and that's for the meat bags and the ballet stands and the residential parking items such as that. Um, we get revenues from the convenience centers. Um, and we also, uh, if they're if recycling is in better shape, the market for the recyclables, we would be getting revenue from that. Um, we also get revenue from um, the different transfer stations that pay us for a waste generation fee that comes in off of that. Um, believe it or not, we get paid for a house mover permit for some items like that. So there are a lot of different revenues that are just generated and handled through our department. But that's just a brief overview of some of them. Okay. And so, um, going back to your to your overall budget, and, and you talked um, about staffing shortages, but what we hear a lot from the public that we still have people in the public who are very insistent that there are some efficiencies that can be found in the budget. Are there any efficiencies that that you've identified as you've been in your evaluative uh, stance uh, with public works? Um, that would perhaps reduce the, the operating budget of, of public work other than the Department of Transportation, which is 77% of the operating budget. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing. So, because yes, there are efficiencies, but it's sort of that, and people don't like to hear this either. Sometimes you got to put a little money in to get a little money out, if that makes sense. So one area that, that I'm really excited about, and I think Public Works is so excited about, is moving to more of an automated software mobile workforce, if that makes sense, because obviously we have a lot of requests that come in. We have a lot of work order traffic where we have crews that are going out to pop, to repair those potholes and that sort of stuff. We're still in a paper mode with that. We have an electronic um, work management system, but our crews are not able to, um, to access that. So one of the uh, things that I'd like to see and we're working with, and, it, and it's global with the whole city um, in, a, in a review, but specifically the public works, would be able to have our crews have their tablets or their computers in their trucks to be able to get that work order. We'd also be able to know where they are to send a crew in an emergency situation that's the closest there. I like to always think of it as the concept of when the when the HVAC repairman comes, he comes with all of his, his tools, but he also has a service request that everything's on his laptop. I think we could save a lot of efficiencies there because we are having manual entry on tracking those dollars. So that's one area. Another area, once again, is to add a little more. You got to add some money, which is some capital dollars with some other software on the solid waste side would be the same thing to be able to track um, what the missed carts, um, track where, where trash carts are, help us with efficiencies on when folks say, well, my recycling didn't get picked up. Well, did you actually put your recycling out? Kind of a thing where we're not making those extra trips and we can know that, that carts are there. So there are some places of some efficiencies that I think that um, we have. But once again, you got to put a little money in in order to get the money out on the other side. Thank you. Thank you, Director. And um, that kind of ties ties into the uh, to the next question. I know we talked about uh, the recycling program moving towards uh, twice a month. Um, can you speak on how the budget has uh, had an impact on that? I know it was discussed that the landfill is you know filling up, and that there will eventually be a higher cost um, if associated 
with having to travel further with trash. So it's, it's going to be a higher cost if we don't move towards that twice a month recycling. So can you speak uh, briefly on um, how the budget constraints have, have had an impact on that? Yes, thank you for that question. I am a big proponent of every other week um, recycling myself. And so that is one. Um, Every other slide, every other week recycling would be an increase in, in personnel so that if we want to say that's a, a shortage in staffing, that certainly is one. It's a discretionary shortage at this time, but you are right that we want to move toward, as I said earlier, more of a zero going to landfills or less going to landfills. So um, approximately um, two and a half million dollars additional to our recycling budget would be necessary for the personnel, the staffing to go to every other uh, week recycling, which um, so that was one that was proposed that due to budget crunch just what was um, eliminated as part of a targeted savings. So about two and a half million dollars would be necessary. Um, recycling is is important to to that landfill um, closing up. Also, it goes to composting and anything we can do to really support the sustainability issues and 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 shrinking our footprint um, to. Uh, to reduce that the idea, because you are correct, um, the landfill at some point will fill up, and where will our trash go? Thank you so very much, uh, Director. And then we're we're running out of time, so we're we're uh, wrapping up our last two questions here. Um, if you could just briefly tell us what impact has COVID had on the services that your uh, department has um, rendered, and did business. Uh, when businesses were uh, limiting their services or closures, did that have any impact on the amount of work that Public Works was responsible for? Um, the pandemic, um, as far as uh, our response, I think that since I, I have been at Public Works, we have we have maintained and have been working very diligently to continue to um, meet the level of service um, for our constituents. Um, uh, I know there has been, particularly in the summer, there was um, definite problems with uh, trash collection, and um, that was mainly related to um, our, our contract uh, collector. And But part of that was related to the pandemic. There was more people at home, so there's more trash. So, um, and then they would have an outbreak of, of drivers because uh, who were quarantined. So we kind of had a compounding problem there, I think, for quite a bit of time in the, in the summer that I think is directly related to the pandemic. Going to the five-day uh, five route really supported um, helping some of that load. But we did see that. Um, we, um, we've seen extra, um, just the volumes of, of trash pickup because of the pandemic across the city. And, and it's really not the volume total, that, that t it's just shift of it. Because people who were going into to their offices and were going into cities that are into their office, they were putting their trash there. And so then it's being picked up by a private hauler as opposed to now they're at home. And so they're generating their trash at home. So I think that's one area that we've really seen a difference in service relative to um, the pandemic. Um, also, Particularly in the early days of the pandemic, when many more people were, were staying at home, um, the roads weren't as traveled, which did provide us some opportunities to, to get in with some um, patching and some potholes, and also not as many because there weren't as much traffic wear and tear on the roads. But um, we have, um, we, we practice social distance. We're, we're, most of our, our team has to be out there to provide the services that we're providing. And so, um, in the very, very early days, we might have had some, okay, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what the pain is. It's so hard to think about what, what life was like in April, um, what, what a difference it is, you know? Um, so, but since that time frame, um, our, our crews have either been out in the field, those who need to be out in the field have been meeting their services, and those who can, have been working from home and providing their service, just like the call center, the 311 folks have been um, have, have been doing their, their work remotely. Thank you, uh, Director Whitewall. And my uh, final question may be more for Ms. Wallstrom, and it's a follow-up to the revenue uh, question. 
Uh, when I asked about uh, revenue for the department, Ms. Wallstrom, you said that the projected revenue for last year was about 56 million. Um, do you have the number of what was actually collected um, in revenue and what has been the actual revenue collections over the last three years? Are we trending upward or is it about the same or is it down? You can expound on that a little bit. You know, I don't have all that documentation with me right now. I know that we have lost some revenue, as you can imagine, and we canceled a lot of the special events that came into town and we get permit money from that. Um, also, the parking garage is downtown, the library and the courthouse. We've lost revenue there because people were not traveling downtown or parking and paying for those, those kind of expenditures. So I know this year, because of COVID, our revenue is down in several areas, mm -hmm. but I do not have that information in front of me, and I can provide that later on. That would be appreciated. And the $56 million, is that for fiscal year 20 or fiscal year 21? That was for fiscal year 2021 was the projection. Okay. okay. And do you know if that projection was above the fiscal year uh, 20 uh, projection? Uh, yes, it was by about $4 million. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. And if you could get that information and I'll share it with um, the council members as, as well as with the public. Okay. And with that, we are going to go ahead and, and wrap up. Thank you so much to our guests from um, Metro Parks and from Public Works. Again, we appreciate everything you all do to serve our city. So uh, from you and your staff, um, the employees of our city, we just appreciate what you all do to take care of us. So thank you so much. And thank you for everyone, uh, our colleagues for joining in as well as the viewing audience. Uh, next week on the 21st, uh, we will have Metro General Hospital. So if you all would like to tune in, we're starting at six o'clock again, and we'll be answering questions um, for Metro General and discussing their budget. So thank you all so much, and we'll see you next week. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.